just for fun. Oh my gosh. It's so flat. It's so stable. What am I even driving? Hey crew, I've got the key to that 24 BMW X5 M competition. We are gonna take it for a drive, but first, let's check it out what looks on the inside and outside. The X5 gets a facelift 424, a life cycle impulse, they call it, which includes things like this blacked out crisscrossed panel here below the grill, which has a matte black finish around it, X5 M logo in the center. You get updated headlights, which are projector LEDs with these directional daytime running lights slash turn signals. Those are above some redesigned corner vents, this one is painted in urban green. It's a non-metallic color that looks like a military green that I quite like, but I'm not sure it fits with a performance luxury vehicle like this one. At the side is a set of two-tone alloy wheels, 21-inch front, 22-inch rear, wrapped in Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tires, sized 295 front and 315 at the back. Within those wheels are M compound brakes with optional black painted calipers and drilled rotors. There's black gloss for the lower garnish, door mirrors, which have an aerodynamic shape to them, window trim and roof rails. The profile shows off a familiar SUV shape that I much prefer to the sloped roof line of the X6M Comp. And I did mention that the wheel gap on the X6M Comp looked pronounced, but it's not as obvious here on the X5. The back shows off a color matched roof mounted spoiler above revised slim LED taillights and turn signals, a black gloss diffuser, and four now blacked out exhaust ports as standard. The 24 updates are a step in the right direction, but don't do too much to enhance the look of what isn't my favorite design generation of the X5. That's Gen 1 or Gen 2. And that's my question for you. What's your favorite looking X5 generation? Let me know in the comments and let's check out the interior. Opening up and looking inside at this Taruma Brown full merino leather interior as standard with black contrast quilting in the center with seat perforations and with the executive package, the rear seats are heated. On the doors, we have sun shades, two tones of leather, more quilting. Leather continues all the way down the door panel. There's some ambient lighting, an optional Bowers & Wilkins diamond surround sound system and carbon fiber trim. Stepping in, is oh so easy to do. Behind my own seat at six feet tall, I've got adequate knee room. The seat back is all in leather. There's a USB-C port hidden here behind each seat. The foot pockets are okay. Thigh support is lacking somewhat. Headroom is not. That's generous underneath this suede wrapped headliner. Gets the thumbs up from me. I do wish the seat backs reclined though, they don't. In the center, we've got air vents. There is a four zone climate control system and two more USB-Cs down there with a DC outlet. The draft shaft dump is fairly recessed, so it's not a chore to get into the middle seat where my head once again clears under this panoramic sunroof. Plus there's room on either side for two more full-size adults, though this middle seat isn't very comfortable. If you don't have a middle passenger, then you get an armrest that comes down with leather topping, a little bit of storage with two deploying cup holders. Let's check out the front. There's no need to slam the doors closed with the executive package and its soft close function, but let's listen for build quality. A very satisfying thud. There isn't smart keyless entry for the rear doors, only for the fronts, and that's kind of surprising. The front seats have illuminating X5 logos, wide winglets for your shoulders, power adjusting side bolsters, thigh extensions, two positions of memory, heating, ventilation, and massage. You've got it all along with X5M comp tread plates, aluminum accented foot pedals, four one-touch windows, power adjusting and power folding door mirrors, a power operated trunk release with its clamshell design. You've got the top portion and an independent tailgate, which is very handy if your kids want to put on cleats for soccer practice. Behind the second row, we've got 34 cubic feet of space. If you get that second row down, which folds 40, 20, 40, though not from back here, you've got to go around to the side and pull on those latches then you've got 72 cubic feet of space. To close the trunk, you can either do so in two parts or hit this one button up here to close both at one time. There's also a power lock function, which is rather handy. 
Soft closing up the door. Here in the driver's seat, we've got a thickly wrapped heated leather steering wheel. Feels great in the hands. Nice small diameter to it as well with customizable M1 and M2 buttons. New large carbon fiber faced paddles with texturing on the back of them. There's a head-up display and a new curved display encompassing both the digital gauge cluster and a 14.9 inch touchscreen, which is quick, crystal clear, vivid, and has wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Around the screen is a carbon fiber inlay, glowing M icon on the passenger side, physical volume knob, seek buttons, and defroster buttons. These being your only physical HVAC controls, everything else is in the infotainment system and requires a little extra attention while driving compared to a button. There's a lot of carbon fiber here on the console. Slide forward this tray to find a wireless charging pad, USB-A port, and heated and cooled cup holders with the executive package. There's a stitched leather wrapped gear selector, drive mode settings, dial to control the infotainment system if you don't want to touch the screen, leather topping your console, and inside is a modest amount of storage with a USB-C port. Visibility is quite good. And there's standard blind spot monitoring with rear cross traffic. This cabin overall is luxurious, stylish, and contemporary, especially with the additions for 2024. Feels fitting of the low $100,000 price point, but now we have to see how it backs it up with the drive. All right, let's fire it up. That is a healthy startup noise. And it also shook the vehicle very briefly on startup, like the engine was getting locked and loaded for duty. I love it. If we want to hear what it sounds like from outside, it's with the exhaust in the loud form, and this is quiet. Can't really tell the difference between the two, but your neighbors may no, that's not true. They're going to know you're starting your day because they're starting theirs, whether they want to or not. Hello, cabin crew. Thank you for joining me for this drive in the 24 BMW X5M competition. We need to go immediately to the drive configurations because there are so many of them. This is going to take a while. We'll go to the setup screen first where you can choose your engine, chassis, steering, braking, and all-wheel drive system settings. And I'll leave everything in the efficient or comfort mode for right now in the all-wheel drive system in just permanent all-wheel drive, not a rear bias to that system. And unlike the M5 or M3, you can't go to a rear drive form. Though how cool would that be? Rear drive X5M. You're just doing donuts in parking lots in a big body SUV. Alas, not an option. And then we'll go to the M mode screen, which has road sport and track versions, all really pertaining to the amount of intervention from your assistance systems. Then from there is your traction and stability control system. You can either have stability on and traction off or both stability and traction off, or of course having them both fully on as we will to start. Then the exhaust modes that I showed you already. Go into reverse, over and up. That brings up a high resolution screen with trajectory lines, a bird's eye view. We've got a car wash view just for lining up your front tires perfectly within those tracks. I love that. And a 3D projection showing you your X5M competition in the same color as you chose to have it. We've got gestures to move around the screen as well. That was wild. The car looked like it passed through us. And that's all of our screens. We can go to the backup assist, which will take us out of a parking space along the same path we used to go into it, doing all the steering for us. I swung wildly into the other lanes. And when you're good there, go into drive, down and over, and away we go. And we'll begin with the world famous horn test. Ooh. What a manicured sounding horn, like, like it was focus grouped a lot to develop the most satisfying horn sound. What about the turn signal sound? Classic, classic BMW. No problems there. The powertrain is still a 4.4 liter twin turbo V8, but now assisted by a 48 volt mild hybrid system for the accessory functions 
like the start stop system, which in this vehicle works very well. You don't really notice it turning off. And when it starts back up, it's so subtle. It's good. How much fuel is it actually saving? Probably not much. And despite the fact that this is smoother than most of the abrupt start-stop systems I've encountered, I still find myself wanting to immediately go and hit that button and switch it off, which thankfully that button is there and so it is easy to do that. Back to the motor. Before this life cycle impulse, which how amazing is it that that's how BMW refers to its facelifts. Before the LCI, the X5M had two flavor outputs. It had the standard X5M with 600 horsepower and the M competition with 617 horses. Now, since the LCI, there is only that competition flavor. So only 617 horsepower and only 553 pound-feet of torque is routed through a ZF-sourced eight-speed automatic gearbox. It is a torque converter automatic, not a dual clutch. And so that means that just moseying about, this transmission is silky in the way it moves between the gears. And as we'll see later, it's still very aggressive in the shifts when you want to drive aggressively. The seats are highly adjustable, not the plushest things in the business, but still with all of their adjustments and the adjustability of the tilt and telescope of this wheel, pretty much any driver is gonna find a good position to operate the X5M competition. And now for the turning radius test. That's really good. It's really very good. Despite not having rear wheel steering like the 50i versions, or now 60i versions of the X5, still pivots around very, very well. The ride quality is sharper than I wish it was. With these steel springs and adaptive dampers, I realize we're on big wheels and low profile tires, but that can't account for all of the choppiness of this ride and how much you hear the imperfections in the road. It's not on the level of being truly intolerable, but it is a little annoying. We do need to see how quick the X5M competition gets to 60 in a real world 0 to 60 test. That's up next. So with my race box set up here to record, I'll want to get ready for launch control. The way you do that is by turning both traction and stability off, then putting yourself in manual mode and making sure your engine is in the Sport Plus mode. But we're not going to do any of that because I've already pre-programmed that into my M1 mode. So with that confirmed, all my settings are there. Then I'm also going to put us into the M mode. Sport. Change up the gauge cluster, have the primary information, like the tack right there in the center. Holding back from the brake, launch control is active, whoa! The kicks to 63.92 seconds is ripping! And those were not perfect conditions. We were on a slight uphill, BMW says the X5M comp will get to 60 in 3.7 seconds, and independent tests have seen 3.5. Just ridiculous. And fully believable when you get on it and hear that V8 come into play. Oh, the thump on the upshift. Gosh darn it, it just pulls so stinking hard. For something to be shaped like this and move like this. It doesn't compute. And that's in auto mode with shift logic three and downshifting instantly. As quick as just about any dual clutch I've experienced, but we have to try manual mode. So move this over, use these nice, large carbon fiber face paddles, quick down shifts. Fractional hesitation on the upshift, but just stupendous forward momentum. There, there have to be embers coming off these rear tires. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, the kid in me is so happy right now. Quick pause for appreciation of SF90. And back to it. Just terrorize, just terrorize the tarmac. Now we need to sample the braking and handling. So I've got the setup screen here for you to see that everything is in max attack. The all wheel drive system is in a rear bias. I've got the traction control off, stability control on, and we're in auto mode once again with Shift Logic 3. So I'll carry good speed into this curve before I go full ABS with the brakes, immediate bite, cut that velocity, turn ins quick, the back end will, yep, it'll rotate with throttle liftoff and manipulation and put that power down. Coming out of the curve. Wow. <laughs> Let's try that again, just for fun. Oh my gosh. It's so flat. It's so stable. What am I even driving? What is this? Because it it can't be an SUV. How does BMW do this? How do they make it be so controlled and so sharp? It's so entertaining and it's it's playful too. Yeah, my esteem is up here for how how the X5M Com performs. I I just don't get it. The steering isn't brimming with feedback but it's got just enough, the edges are just defined enough to tell you what's going on, to tell you that yes, the tires still have grip. And yes, you can make it through that curve with as much speed as you feel like you can handle, and it just does. Now, I will say, for all the praise I've been heaping on this torque converter automatic, it did upshift on me right as I backed off, just for a fraction of a second as I was setting up to enter the second portion of that second curve. So maybe the right answer, if you plan on doing highly aggressive maneuvers like that, is to be in manual mode for those sections. Now that we're done, just goofing off and having fun, let me take it out of M mode, settle back into the efficient engine and comfort for all the other stuff, and quiet up so we can listen for the NVH level at highway speeds. Alright, so two very different experiences depending on the road's surface. So on this quieter strip of road, it's mellow and going over the louder section, you do hear a lot from those tires. For the most part, if you are on smooth strips of tarmac for your commute, then you'll enjoy minimal wind noise, not much noise from the tires, the engine more subdued with the exhaust. Oh, that was with the exhaust loud. This is what I mean. I can't really tell the difference between the two. You don't hear much from that motor is the point. And the ride settles in at highway speeds. You can clearly feel where the X5M comp was engineered to perform on German Autobahns, carrying a lot of velocity, getting you from A to B quickly and comfortably. It's very good here. Now we don't have the adaptive cruise control system or steering assist, which I feel like should be standard on a vehicle that starts in the low to mid $100,000 territory. You have to pay thousands of dollars extra for those systems, which do work very well. And you may want them if you plan on doing long distance travel and can benefit from those systems. Why are they not here as standard BMW? Why? More money, that's the answer. Now let's get into the miles per hour word of the day, which for the 24 BMW X5 M competition is dominant, meaning superior or commanding. When thinking about SUVs, more traditional two box SUVs, not coupe design models, I can't think of a more dominant performance in the realm of performance than this vehicle. I can think of a more luxurious performance from this class, but not a more dynamic experience. And so it's just dominant if you want something shaped like this 
to do the things this does. I will bring up in just a sec what the X5M comp competes against. That's confusing. Uh, but first, let's talk fuel economy and top speed. The fuel economy for the X5M comp is 13 mpg in the city, 18 on the highway, and 15 combined. Yes, you will go through fuel quickly in this vehicle. And if you have the M driver's package for an extra $2,500, then the top speed is raised from 155 to 177 miles per hour. The starting price for this vehicle is 123,000 buckaroos, and this one as tested is 141 grand. When thinking about competition for the X5M, got quite a few options. I'm going to limit them to vehicles with a one at the beginning of their price, not a two or a three or more. So that means we've got the Audi RS Q8 that starts at $124,000. It makes 591 horsepower, gets to 60 in 3.3 seconds, has a top speed of 190 miles per hour and fuel economy of 16 combined. We have the Mercedes AMG GLE 63S Coupe. It's now only offered as a coupe. It starts at $129,000, makes 603 horsepower, gets to 60 in 3.6 seconds, has a top speed of 174 miles per hour and fuel economy of 17 combined. And then we've got the Porsche Cayenne Turbo GT. That starts at $198,000, so just barely making its way into my criteria. It's It makes 650 horsepower, gets to 60 in 3.1 seconds, has a top speed of 189 miles per hour and fuel economy of 16 combined. So you probably noticed that all the vehicles I just mentioned are the coupe design SUV, not the more traditional two box shape. And that's because right now we don't really have anything that would directly compete with this X5. If it was last fall to year 23, I would say the Porsche Cayenne GTS and I would have to have rescinded my comment about the X5M competition in the performance context being the most dominant because the Cayenne Turbo or the Cayenne GTS is just ridiculously good to drive. I think it could do everything I just did in this vehicle probably another one or two miles per hour quicker with a little more confidence inspired in me, the driver, but we don't have it for 24. It'll probably come back for 25 and then I'll be back having this conversation with you once again. But among the coupe design SUVs, I like the price point of the Audi RS Q8. I like it's more modest design. It's got a better ride quality than this. It just can't hang in terms of performance and it doesn't have the same pizzazz to the interior as this vehicle does. So I think I'd choose this ever so slightly more than the RS Q8. The GLE 63S doesn't really do it for me personally in terms of the exterior styling or the dynamics. They're much more boisterous vehicles, but they don't have the, the precision of the X5M competition. And that Porsche Cayenne Turbo GT is indisputably the best driving vehicle in the SUV class right now, but it is a healthy bit more money. Obviously, if you have that money to spend and you value driving more than any other criteria, then by all means, go get that. But if you don't, then the X5M competition is a really nice place to settle in. I think that the ride could be softened, but in all other regards, this thing just crushes it. Give it to me in a different color and, and call it a day. Which would you guys choose? Would you have the X5M competition? Would you get the Audi RS Q8? Would you have the Mercedes AMG GLE 63S or the Porsche Cayenne Turbo GT? Let me know in the comments. I hope you guys have enjoyed this POV drive review. If you did, please like, comment, and share it. Subscribe to the channel, hit that bell to get notified, and I'll see you again next time.